Excuse me. And with that, I'm gonna pass to my sister here, to my left, Susan Silver. Thank you. I'd like to thank the organizers of this roundtable for highlighting deserving issues that would otherwise fly under our radar. I also want to address the needs of an invisible community. I'm going to be talking about ex-offenders who need jobs. I'm an appellate attorney with the New Jersey Office of the Public Defender, and what being an appellate attorney means is that all of my clients have been convicted of a crime. So I very well understand the problems of people who are stigmatized as convicted criminals. So I want to shine a light on the difficulties that ex-offenders face in getting a job and reintegrating back into the community, because the one thing that an ex-offender needs is a job. Uh, we live in a mass incarceration society with 2.2 million people in custody. That's one out of every 100 Americans. Almost all of them are eventually released. Close to 2,000 people every day leave jail and prison. This is over 725,000 people each year. They're a diverse group of people, but they share one thing in common. Each and every one of them needs a job. Their successful reentry is a matter of both our compassion as well as our self-interest. One of the themes of this roundtable is interconnectedness. That's very much true in this area as well, because if my clients, someone coming out of prison, cannot get a legitimate job, they need to survive. So if they can't get a legitimate job, in order to survive, they'll do something that's less than legitimate, and that can harm us or the people we know or someone in our community. These numbers are more than just abstract numbers. They really reflect real people struggling to make a life. To give an example, one of my clients was caught driving without a license, not a, a suspended license. Not a serious crime, but he was sentenced to 18 months in jail. He, at the time of his arrest, he had a great job. He was a store manager. It was a job he held for 15 years. He owned a home with his wife, two kids, and a dog. But when he landed in jail, the first thing that happened to him was he lost his job. And without an income, he couldn't make mortgage payments. His house went into foreclosure, and his wife, two daughters, and dog had no home. And he was sitting in jail, helpless. When he came out of jail, he was desperate to get a job, and he couldn't do so because of his criminal record. So here was someone without a serious crime, with a great record of employment, he could not get a job. Another client of mine, I actually won his case. His conviction was overturned, but rather than be overjoyed that he was about to be released from prison, he was afraid for his future. And he called me and he said, the minute he walks out of that prison, he's homeless. He doesn't have a job. He didn't know how to get a job. He didn't know how to put a roof over his head. And he said to me, just tell me what to do. I'm scared. And there was so few resources that I could really direct his way that would make a difference. America houses 12 million ex-offenders. That's approximately 8% of our working age population. And being an ex-offender is like having a scarlet letter that's branded on your chest. Even after someone's sentence ends, this stigma and effect goes on and on really forever. It negatively affects someone's eligibility for housing, food stamps, bank loans, student loans. It affects a person's right to vote, be on a jury, have a driver's license, adopt or, or foster a child. Ex-offenders may not be bad people, but the decisions that they made years or even decades ago lead them to be trapped and really be unable to get their lives back on track. And at the very top of the list of all these collateral consequences of a conviction is difficulty in getting a job. Employers, their discrimination against the ex-offender community, that discrimination runs very deep. In one survey, 80% of employers refused to even consider someone for a job once they found out that that person had a criminal record. And black applicants with a, with a criminal record, they're only 5% likely to be called back for an interview compared to 17% of whites with a criminal record. And the woman who did that research understood that her findings actually grossly underestimate uh, the problems and the barriers that people with, with uh, criminal records face. Almost all employers do a criminal background check on job applicants. Only 7% do not. So criminal background checks is really the norm for getting a job. 
having a prison record is this incredible obstacle to employment, but without that legitimate job, someone is much more likely to reoffend. So it's a, it's a cycle that we need to break. And the best way to do that is to encourage the hiring of ex-offenders. So what works? I have 12 recommendations to really increase opportunities for hiring ex-offenders. First, this might sound dramatic, but we should eliminate the criminal record entirely after a cer certain period of time. Research shows that after seven years of being conviction free, someone with a criminal record has no greater likelihood to reoffend than someone with no criminal record. So what I'm proposing is that we shut off access to public databases that show criminal convictions when someone has been conviction free for seven years after they get out of prison. Second, we should enact ban the box laws that prevent employers from asking about an applicant's criminal record until later in the process. Typically, it's after an interview or after a conditional job offer is made. Ban the box laws give ex-offenders a chance to explain themselves uh, and to really make their case, be, uh, that show that they're worthy before they're just simply ruled out of question. 15 states have banned the box laws. New York is not one of them. Uh, there's been research that has, in fact, just as recently as this past month, that showed that ban the box laws increase employment, particularly in the high crime neighborhoods. In Minneapolis, the ban the box policy led to hiring nearly 60% of applicants for whom the background check would have raised potential concern. Third, we should give economic incentives, such as tax credits, to hire ex-offenders. We do have a federal work opportunity tax credit that does provide limited tax breaks. We should expand this to include state laws as well. Fourth, we should reduce an employer's exposure to negligent hiring liability. For example, in Kentucky, an employer cannot be assessed punitive damages for an employee's act unless the employer authorized the conduct or should have anticipated the conduct. Fifth, we should tweak laws that prohibit ex-offenders from getting licenses or employment. Most states bar ex-offenders from certain occupations like law, education, real estate, nursing, medicine. Six states, including New Jersey, permanently bar ex-offenders from public employment. A carefully drafted bar makes sense, but we need to ensure that these laws are not overly broad because we don't want to be disqualifying competent people just because 40 years ago they had a minor indiscretion that's unrelated to the job they're now seeking. Sixth, we should provide education, job opportunities, uh, job training opportunities, and work support to make ex-offenders more marketable. Research shows that these sorts of, of resources help ex-offenders secure jobs and break the cycle of crime. We need to combine job search and placement support with services that address an ex-offender's barriers to employment, such as low skills and substance abuse. One program called the Prison Entrepreneurship Program that's in Texas helps inmates build business skills while they're in prison and then meets them at the prison gate when they're released to connect these individuals with jobs as well as health care and housing. And in this particular program, 93% of the participants remained arrest free for three years after the release from prison. Seventh, we should help ex-offenders get identification documents that they'll need to apply for a job. Just this last week, U.S. Attorney General Loretta Lynch urged states to allow inmates to trade their prison ID for state-issued ID, which they need to seek employment. In Texas, of all places, they have a mobile unit that issues identification cards to people leaving prison, which they need to get a job. Eighth, we should amend anti-discrimination laws to protect ex-offenders from unfair discrimination. Wisconsin has a broad law that prohibits employment discrimination based on a person's arrest or conviction record. New York's law is much more narrow. They enacted a law here in 2010 that prevents an employer from denying a job based on a person's record unless there's a direct relationship between the past offense and the specific license or job, or unless it's deemed necessary to prevent unreasonable risk to safety or property. The American Law Institute is proposing an update to the model penal code that would turn collateral consequences of, of conviction into discretionary sanctions, require that the sanctions expire at the end of the sentence, and create a certificate of good conduct available to an inmate five years after release from prison. And this kind of an update could actually have a broad impact because many states model their sentencing laws on the model penal code. Ninth. We should amend federal statutes like Title VII to include ex-offenders as a protected class under federal law. 
In 2012, the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission issued guidelines that advised employers that they may be violating civil rights laws if they consider criminal records when it's not related to the job at issue. The EEOC guidelines could be further strengthened to limit an employer's use of criminal records to only recent offenses of a serious nature. Tenth, defense attorneys should be required to explain to their clients the collateral consequences that stem from a guilty plea. This is now feasible because the American Bar Association recently cataloged all the collateral consequences in an online database called the National Inventory of Collateral Consequences of Conviction. In North Carolina, the state passed a law that requires that the state notify defendants of collateral consequences and also allows for people, in those defendants, to mitigate those consequences in certain circumstances. Eleventh, we should require prisons and jails to develop discharge plans when people are leaving the jail or the prison to help connect those individuals with appropriate community resources to find jobs, housing, substance abuse treatment, and mental health care. This would help people like my client who really didn't know where to turn for help. Finally, we should create prisoner re-entry courts to reduce the chance that released individuals return to prison. Right now, a very large percentage of the people who have minor technical violations of their probation and parole are returned to a long prison sentence. And re-entry courts uh, the connected defendant with community resources and treatment so they can remain in the community rather than return to prison. Prisoner reentry courts provide a carrot in the form of incentives to meet reentry milestones and a stick in the form of sanctions when a person violates the terms of participation. When a person enters a reentry court, he's released from prison with a personalized action plan that he must follow. He periodically then goes before the judge to explain his progress on that personalized action plan and he receives graduated sanctions or rewards depending on how well he does. The federal government enacted its first prisoner reentry law in 2007 called the Second Chance Act, which granted $250 million to state and local governments to pursue research-backed prisoner reentry programs and explore what works. One of the programs that works under that law, that, under that funding, is in Brooklyn. The Red Hook Community Justice Center offers a GED program, a housing resource center, job training, substance abuse treatment, and other services, and in the first few years of that program's existence, low-level crime in the Red Hook neighborhood dropped by 60%. So it's really a hugely successful program that gets at the root causes of many of the problems. We need more programs like that. Just as Anthony Kennedy, Anthony Kennedy recognized that our society really focuses, in, in his words, perhaps an obsessive focus on the process for determining guilt and innocence. He said our resources are misspent, our punishments too severe, and our sentences too long. And of course, none of the criminal justice and law enforcement resources go to helping a person reintegrate back into society. So the 12 recommendations that I outline will create meaningful job opportunities for ex-offenders and will enhance our community safety in a humane and cost-effective manner, and they're undeniably the right steps to take. Thank you.